Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Baba Bat Chadaf Lamed Chet. We're going to start at the bottom, Amre Nahardia. In Nahardia, they said, okay, if you remember last, yesterday we had a sugya also, Nahardia said, and then Rabbi disagreed, we're going to have the same structure. Nahardia said, means the rabbis in Nahardia, said that Haiman de Zeben Dikla Lechavre, Kainle Mishipule Ad Tahoman. If you buy a tree, meaning a lone tree, okay, a palm tree or two, right, as long as it's not three, you don't get the land around, but you do get the land below all the way, all the way down to the depths. Okay, what does this give you? So the Rosh Bam says it gives you two things. Number one, the very last line of the Rosh Bam in yesterday's death, if the tree dies, you can build, uh, plant a new one in its place. Number two, if the owner wants to dig all the way under for something, they can't because you own that land, again, going directly under the tree. Matkifla Rava. Rava says, what are you talking about? How could this possibly be? If your tree dies, the owner could say to you, hey, I sold you a tree. It's like I sold you a saffron plant. Now, what happens with a saffron plant? A saffron plant, once it grows, you're done with it. Then you, you uproot it. It's not going to grow again. So the owner could say, okay, your tree died. Get rid of your stump and get out of here. Take what you want from it. And you don't have any rights to be here. So why are we assuming that you get the ground underneath and you can plant a new tree in instead? Ella Amar Rabba Sarava says this can't possibly be. This must be that you came with a claim. What does it mean you came with a claim? So let's look in the Rashbam. The Rashbam says, It's much lower down on the daf, about another 10 lines down in the Rashbam. I come and I say, not only did you sell me this tree, but you told me you were selling me the land, meaning I make a claim. Not that, right? I make a claim that you actually, it's not just I stomp out a tree. I say, I bought a tree and I bought the land and more than that, right? I bought the rights to plant a new tree in its stead. Ubishtar, and we had a document. Now, where is that document? Oh, well, I've been eating the fruits of this tree for three years. I've been benefiting from the fruits. I've been selling them, whatever. And therefore, I lost the document already. But I believe that in the document it said, not only did I buy the tree, but I also bought the rights to the land. That's a bit of a strange claim because, okay, I understand that I, I could claim I've been benefiting from the fruits for all these years. But if the standard way you sell one tree is not with the, with the ground underneath, with the, the earth, then why on earth am I believed in this case? And it's in fact exactly what Markashisha is going to ask Rav. Amale Markashisha, Bereidu Rav Chistel Ravashi, Vi Korkam Adorishka al Zavinle, Mai Havalele Meabad. So if you're the person who sold me this tree, and you sold me the tree and the land. And, sorry, you sold me just the tree, not the land. And I come and claim you sold me the tree and the land. Now, I've got the star, but I claim the star got lost. And now I have rights to claim I bought the land. So how are you supposed to protect yourself from this? So we've been learning this chapter long enough. You should know the answer to this. Well, if I'm using your tree and getting all the fruits from it, and you didn't sell me the land underneath, your, your, um, your responsibility is to limchot. You have to protest and say, at some point during the three years, I just want everyone to know that Michelle just bought the rights to the tree. She did not buy the roots. Okay? And the, not the roots, the, the ground underneath. And as long as you do that, you protect yourself. And now we're going to get to the mantra of our, right? We have a, we've been doing this mantra every once in a while. We keep getting back to this line. Do you love Tate Mahalchi? If you don't say, right, we already, it started already with you needed to protest. And if you don't say that, that it's the owner's responsibility to protest, well, how else do you explain mashkante desura? Hani mashkante desura de katabahachi, since it says in the mashkante desura, b'mishlam shnin elin tipuk aradala below kesef, after these amount of years, the land is going to revert back to the original owner without them having to pay anything because I'm going to gain the produce all this time and right, in place of the loan. And who keeps the loan, who keeps the document? The person, the, the lender, the creditor keeps the document that says this land belongs to someone else, right? And it's just mine for collateral. 
Now he covets the shamash kanta. Vamar the kuchi biadi. Now after the mob has been eating produce for the lamb for three years, and then goes back and says, "Oh, by the way, I I, I lost the star and right and really he could if no, not the if he, he could claim there is no star, he could hide it, claim there's no star, and just say, "Oh, by the way, I bought this land and I've been living there for three years. That's the proof." Hachinami de mehema. What we're going to believe this person? And if we believe the Malve that this land is theirs, well, mitakne rabbanu milta daati beli deip seida. What the rabbis instituted the shkanta desiru, which basically becomes a huge opportunity for the Malve to steal land from the from the borrower. That's crazy. Ella, the only way to explain it is to say, ibai le machuye. The responsibility is on anyone who gives their land for collateral. Is it they have to protest? Hachanami ibai le machuye. So we'll just say the same thing here. If you sold someone the tree and just the tree, well, you better make sure that at some point you protest and say, you know, just so everybody knows, this land, I didn't give them the land at all. And that's the way you protect yourself. Okay, new Mishnah. Shalosh aratzot lechazaka. Yehuda, Ever HaYerdeim, Vahagalil. It's three areas where you can't create a chazaka from one to the other. That means, we're going to see right now. Uh, let's just read it. Hayab Yehuda, okay, this is Judea, the Galilee, and the Transjordan area. So, Hayab Yehuda v'chzik Bagalil. If you were in Judea and someone had your land that you owned in the Galil and they were living there, or Bagalil v'chzik Yehuda, the reverse, ena chazaka, ad shehei mo b'bedinachat. You have to be living in the same region, okay, not the same city, but the same general region, which we'll explain much more when we get to the Gemara, in order to protest. If not, it's not considered that you could have protested because you were somewhere else far away, couldn't get there. And therefore, since you couldn't have protested, well, they can't claim a chazaka based on three years. They know the owner's far away. So their responsibility is to keep the star longer than three years. They can't claim, oh, I lost it. And look, nobody protested because the, nobody protested because they don't live there and they can't get there and they didn't know or, or maybe they protested and you didn't hear. So that's not considered you can't create a chazaka in that situation. Here comes a different approach and totally different from the way we've understood chazaka until now. The reason for chazaka three years is because we assume people lose documents and they don't need to keep it for more than three years, right? Because if no one protested, we assume, okay, they're okay with it. Why did we come up with this three years? It has nothing to do with how long you keep your documents for. It's just because we have to give enough time for the most extreme ca- extreme case. Somebody goes to Aspamia, which was a faraway place, different opinions. Some people think it's Spain. Most people don't think that. But anyway, go to Aspamia, a faraway place. While you're there, the person lives in your land for a year. Then, then witnesses have to come tell you, by the way, Michelle, you know someone's living in your land? And they go, and they go all the way to Aspamia to tell you that takes them a year. And then, and then you get back and you could get there, let's say, on the last day of the third year, and then you can have time to protest. That's why they said three years, because it's going to take about three years for someone who's far away to be able to protest. There's a bunch of different opinions about what exactly Rabbi Yehuda disagrees with Tanakama. In fact, some people even think he doesn't disagree with Tanakama, but we're not going to go there. But assuming he disagrees, first of all, most people think that Rabbi Yehuda holds, and I think it comes up in the, in the Gemara um, in a few Dapim. The Rabbi Yehuda holds that you can even create a chazaka from one moment. Because what do you see here? You could come at the last moment of the third year. If at any moment I see you in my land and I don't protest, that already means it's yours. Because there's an assumption that as soon as I know, I'm going to protest. Okay, it just might take me some time till I get there or till I find out. Um, and the other thing he disagrees is that even if you can't, even if uh, you're in these faraway places, Right? There's still always a way to get there, basically. So it might take longer, but you know the three years kind of includes that. Even if you're far away, it should work. Okay, so Rabbi Yehuda has a different approach to this whole thing. And, and again, thinks that the whole reason for Chazaka is different than we've said until now. So, my Kasavar Tanakama. The Gemara starts off with, what's the reason for Tanakama? What does Tanakama hold? Ikasavar. Now we're going to get into this other idea about whether a mecha'a, if I protest and you're not there to hear it, is that considered a mecha'a? Can I assume, well, if I did it before witnesses, well, somehow they'll get word to you. Okay, do I have to protest in front of you? Or can I just protest in front of witnesses and assume somehow you'll hear? 
So if Tanakama holds Macha'a Shalom B'fanav Havya Macha'a, that even if I don't do it in front of you, it's still Macha'a, well then a filu Yudav Galil Nami, even if they're far away places, eventually it'll get back to you. And Ikasavar Macha'a Shalom B'fanav Lo Havya Macha'a, if we think that if I don't protest in front of you, it's not a Macha'a, then and it's, if, I, if I protest not in front of you, that won't count. Why do you talk about regions? You could just say a different city within Judea should still be a problem. So you shouldn't have just given those examples of these three lands. So question is, what does Tanakhama really hold? Rav is going to answer this question. Rabbi Abba Barmama is going to quote from Rav. Rabbi Abba Barmama lama Rav, la'olam kasavar macha'a shalo b'fanav havi macha'a. Really? We hold protesting in front of the Tanakama holds, protesting in front of someone is a Macha'a, is a real protest, even if you're not there. Why then Judea and the Galilee does it not work? The Mishnah is talking about an emergency situation. What does that mean? Well, what it really means is that the, we're talking about a situation where the rulers in the Galilee don't get al- along with the rulers in Judea. And because of and the ones in the Transjordan, and because of that, no one can get from one place to the other. So even if you think from one city in Judea to the other city, I can protest. You don't have to hear because eventually we assume word will get to you. But not if you're in a place where nobody can get through. If the rulers don't allow people from other areas into their their region, then no one's ever going to get there, and you'll never hear. And that's what's going on in our mission. To which the Gemara still questions that. So why did they bring the example of Yudah and the Galilee? They could have said any place where it's Shat Chirum. That would have been a more clear uh, Mishnah. Ha This comes to teach you, turning now to Amabet, Distam Yehudah v'Galil Kashat Chirum Dami. They wanted to give you this example of Judea and the Galilee, which is the example that the Mishnah brought. At first they talked about three lands, but then they gave the example of Judea and the Galilee because they wanted you to know that in a time of emergency, that the Judea and the Galilee are always like they're in a time of emergency. Even when the rulers aren't so careful about these things, still people do not travel from one to the other, either because there's not um, there's no transportation that goes from one to the other. Um, in the Koran, they had a, a note that talked about how this, there's a strip of land owned by the Samaritans, and they wouldn't allow, we're right on the border there, and they wouldn't allow people to go from one to the other. Um, so, anyway, it's teaching you something additional. So, what we have right now is that Rav explains Tanakama as saying, Tanakama holds. You actually can lodge a protest if you live far away, it's still considered a protest, which means you could create a chazak if someone, if the owner is far away, just not if it's between places where there's no transportation or no ability for anybody to get from one to the other. Now we're going to have two versions of a statement of Rav, and we're going to have to reconcile it with what Rav said right here. You can't do a chazaka on property that someone had run away. Somebody ran away from town because someone was after them. So you can't do a chazaka on their land. Now, when I said this before, Shmuel, Amarli. So Rav Yehuda, I quoted this in the name of Rav, and then he brought it to the Beit Midrash of Shmuel. Often this happened after Rav died. He went to learn with Shmuel, and Amarli, Shmuel said, I don't understand. What? He has to do, it is the issue with the person who ran away is because the person who ran away will never come back. And if he'll never come back, well, he can't lodge a protest in person. And that seems to imply you need to have a protest in person. Well, if that's the case, right? So Rav, my Kamashma, and so by Rav telling us the Salaha, what was he trying to say? The Mecha'a Shalom B'Fanav Lo Havi Mecha'a, right? The protesting not in someone's, in the face of the person who's living in your land is not considered Mecha'a. But if you say that, what did we just say on the previous Amud? Ha Amar Rav. Rav was quoted by Rav Abba Bar Mamal as saying, Mecha'a Shalom B'Fanav Havi Mecha'a. That's, remember when Rav is explaining Tanakama's position, that's exactly what Rav said. That's how we understand Tanakama. Really, Mecha'a, not there, would work. But this is a unique situation. So the Gemara answers, very easy answer. Rav Tama de Tana Digan Kamefalshe, the Lelo Sfirale. What did the Gemara there say? What is the reason for Tanakama? And Rav gave an explanation. That wasn't Rav's opinion, that was just Rav explaining Tanakama. But Rav holds like Rabbi Yehuda. And then we would say, okay, going back to the difference between Rav and Rabbi Yehuda, Rav, 
right? Rab, sorry, Rav Yehuda holds, Mecha'a Shalom B'fanav doesn't count. How do we know that? Because the whole reason for Shalosh Shanim is so that you have time to get back to do the Mecha'a. You have to do the Mecha'a in person. So there you have it. Rav holds like Rav Yehuda, and that's why Rav said you can't do a Chazaka if somebody ran away. Because somebody ran away is never coming back. And that doesn't contradict what Rav said, because Rav is just explaining Tanakama, and Rav doesn't, and Tanakama holds differently. Ikeda Amri, second version of what Rav said, and this is actually going to match what Rav said previously, but it's still going to cause Shmuel to have a question. Okay, now we have the opposite, which obviously then is going to work with Rav, because it's the opposite of what it was before, where it didn't work with what Rav said. When I said this in front of Shmuel, I'm Arli, Pshita said to me, oh, this is obvious. Why do you even need to say this? What? <laughs> Rav is telling us, if you live in the land of someone who ran away, it's okay because the person who ran away can just protest somewhere else and eventually you'll hear it and that's totally fine. Now, Rav is basically telling us, right? So my, Rav, my kamash balan, what's he trying to tell us? It's obvious because if Rav is just trying to teach us, that you can lodge a protest far away and it's still considered a protest, and that's why you can have a chazak on the land of someone who ran away. Rav already said this some other time, right? Rav said it, and what we just described when Rav was describing Tanakama. Ella ha kamash so now we're going to say no. Rav wanted to teach you something additional. By Rav saying you can have a chazak on land of someone who ran away, Rav was teaching you the following. Just like if I run away and I can lodge a protest far away, even though there's no way I could get back. And we know that already. So what is that coming to teach us? Something additional. If I lodge a protest in front of two witnesses, now what's the assumption? I don't have to be there, but I can tell the witnesses and the witnesses will eventually wake their way back to tell you. But comes Rab and says, no, just like the Boreach is never coming back. Even if I ran away, because I was, you know, wanted, I ran away. I then testified in front of two witnesses that I, I don't want you in my land. And those witnesses can't make it back either. Okay, some people say maybe they didn't have legs. Okay, there was some issue that was preventing them from getting back, and there was no way they were able to get back and lodge a protest. Well, according to Rav, that is still a macha. Okay, we're going to see in a minute that it's because word of mouth. So what if they can't get there? They'll tell someone else, and that someone else can go. Okay? Now we're going to see. Shmuel doesn't agree with this halacha. So this is the second version of Rav, and it's what we're explaining Rav must be t- coming to tell you. It says de'amar, but it really should be ve'amar, and, and Rav Anan, or just amar Rav Anan, and that's what the Rashbam is a different version here. It gets rid of the Dalid. I heard from Shmuel the following. If you protest between two witnesses, if you protest in front of two witnesses who can eventually get back and tell the person, that's a legitimate protest. But But if you protest in front of two people who can't get the message there, then lo have your macha'a. That is not a macha'a. And Rav, Rav holds, chavera chavre'ile, ve chavre de chavera chavre'ile. This is what we say, word of mouth. Your friend has a friend, right? We'll tell their friend, their friend will tell their friend, their friend will tell their friend. Eventually, word will get to you. And that's why not only do you not have to be there, that everyone agrees with, but not only, well, not everyone. Okay, Rabbi, Rabbi Yudah doesn't agree with that. And the way we explain Rav, Rav in the first reading, Rav didn't agree with it either. Okay, Rav thinks you have to actually be there. But right now we're in the other version, which is Rav and Shmuel both agree that you don't have to be able to get there. But your witnesses, according to Shmuel, need to get there. If your witnesses can't get there, it's not good. And Rav says, what do you mean? Witnesses will tell others, and eventually you'll hear about it. Now we get to the halacha lamaase. I'm a Rava. Hilchata ein machzikim b'nechzei boreach. We don't allow you to do a chazaka in the land of a boreach, of someone who ran away. Now, this would seem to indicate what? That if you lodge a protest, not in the face of the person who, who you're protesting, it doesn't work. But what does Rav say? But Rav Paskins itself in the opposite. He says, you can't have a chazaka in the land of someone who runs away, 
but you could lodge a protest even if you're not in front of them. So, the Gemara says, Tarte, those two things contradict each other. It's like an oxymoron. Lokashya. Now, that's not a problem. Why not? Kan beboreach machmat mamon, kan boreach machmat maritim. It says, boreach means different things, and lo befanav could be different things. Lo befanav, where we say, when Rav Pas- uh, Rava Paskin, if you protest, not in the face of the person who was living in the land, it's a macha'ad, counts. We're talking about someone who ran away for money reasons. Someone who ran away for money reasons is not scared for their lives, okay? They just ran away, but not so scared. They can lodge a protest. The protest will get back to you. Okay. But if you ran away, machmat maridim, because people accused you of murder, whether it's true or not true, it doesn't really matter. But if you were accused of murder and people are out to kill you, you're scared for your life. If that's the case, if someone's living in your land, you're not going to start protesting because you're running away and you want to make sure they don't find you. Now, if you start saying things that will become public and get passed around, people might find your whereabouts. So, since you don't want that to happen, you're not going to lodge a protest. If you can't lodge a protest, then it's not considered a protest, right? In other words, then no one, not that, but if you can't lodge a protest, then there's no chazaka on your land. And that's why Rava ruled that he meant to borev someone who was running for their lives. Whereas could be relating to someone who ran away because someone wanted money from them. Last thing for today, what is the language of a protest? To protest, what do you have to say? Professor Rafzu is going to say what you can't say, what isn't going to work, and then he'll say what does work. Sorry, so and so is a gazlan, is a thief. That doesn't count because if you're living in my land and I just say you're a thief, it could be you stole from somebody else. It could be you stole, you know, it doesn't mean you stole my land. It could be you stole some objects of mine, right? It doesn't mean you're living in my land and I don't permit you to. Because it could be you stole from someone else. It could be you stole something else from me. But if you say, say, this guy is a thief who took my land by stealing it. And tomorrow I'm taking this guy to court. That is a language of a protest. Let's do a review of our daf. We started with this Nahardean and Ravid disagreed about do you automatically, right? Do, anytime you buy a tree, you get the land all the way underneath. Rabbi Lu said, no, only if you have a chazaka, you've been living there three years and claim you lost your star, then, and you claim that in the star it said they gave you the land, you're believed. And what does the other side do to protect themselves? Well, they have to protest, just like we know from the Mashkanta de Sur. Then we got to the three arts of the chazaka, the Tanakama, Rabbi Yehuda debate, which again, we mentioned some of the possibilities about what exactly they disagree about. And Rabbi Yehuda says, right, the whole reason for three years is so that if you're far away, you get back in time, because Rabbi Yehuda really thinks doesn't work. And the rabbis, Tanakhama, thinks it does work. And that's what we went to explain. Rav explained Tanakhama's position, that it works, but just not from areas where no one can get through at all. And from there, we learned that Yudah and the Galil, really nobody could travel from one to the other. Then we had two different versions of what Rav said about Nechsei Boreach, can you do a chazaka, can you not? And then we had to figure out how it reconciled, how it fit, worked together with what Rav said on the, on, on the previous statement he made. And then we showed that Rav and Shmuel had this disagreement according to the second version about whether someone who um, can't, who even the witnesses can't get back, is that considered a macha or not? If you, if you protest in front of witnesses who can't actually get all the way back, does that work or does it not work? And then we ended with what's the language of uh, a macha. With that, we'll finish for today. Wishing everyone a good day.